Good evening, everybody. Thank you for braving the elements and joining us tonight. I know you're as excited as I am to hear from these two master choreographers. My name is Jen Summers, and I'm the director of the Houston Ballet Academy. And t I usually say on behalf of Stanton Welch, but here he is, so <laughs> yes. I'd like to welcome you to the Margaret Alkeck Williams Center for Dance and Dance Lab. Uh, we have a, 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 an amazing conversation in store for you tonight. Um, I don't think it's every day that we get two choreographers of this caliber to, well, maybe you speak to each other all the time, but we don't get to listen in on that, and so we are in for a treat. Um, one of the things as we wrap, we come towards the end of Stanton's 20th season as artistic director of Houston Ballet, yes. One of the things that we talk a lot about is uh, what drew him to Houston Ballet was that he felt as a choreographer that this was a choreographer's Eden. And it was very important to him as he took over as artistic director to continue that. And what that means is, and maybe Justin will speak to this when he gets the mic, is that he endeavors to make this a place where choreographers can come and the ground is fertile and the dancers are excellent and the resources are plentiful to create innovative work that moves ballet forward. Um, and I think we, if you look at, the, at our repertoire over the last 20 years, you'll see how committed he has been to that. The, the proof is in the sheer number of world premieres that we have in our rep, as well as works by choreographers that we had not had graced the stage um, in Houston prior to his arrival. Um, his, the relationship that Houston Ballet has had with Justin Peck is part of that. Um, and I'm gonna just, I guess, because I don't feel like I really have to introduce who you are so much. I will also just say, as I transition to talking about Justin, um, Justin has three ballets at, as soon as this one's premiered. We have three of his ballets in our rep, um, two of which are world premieres for Houston Ballet. Um, and then by comparison, because Justin's only been with us since 2017, we have 44 world premieres in our uh, rep that Stanton Welch created. So that's a lot. I need glasses now that I've been doing this so long. I'm gonna read a little bit and um, there's a lot and I'm, I'm gonna pick my favorite parts, I guess, out of Justin's bio. Um, Justin Peck is a Tony Award-winning choreographer, director, filmmaker, and dancer based in New York City. He currently serves as the acting resident choreographer of the New York City Ballet. He has created over 50 dance works, more than 20 of those for New York City Ballet. His works have been performed by a bazillion companies, but I'll just highlight a few. <laughs> the Paris Opera Ballet, San Francisco Ballet, Australian Ballet, Boston Ballet, National Ballet of Canada, and Houston Ballet. Um, he's well known for working with artists in other fields. He's a co great collaborator. Um, you know uh, his collaboration with Sufjan Stevens from the, the Year of the Rabbit that we did in, that's a first piece of his we did back in 2017. He's worked with many other uh, musicians and visual artists. Um, and Justin has already also choreographed for films. Um, so get your pencils out if you want to check out these films. Um, the Red Sparrow in 2016, starring Jennifer Lawrence. West Side Story in 2021, and I'm gonna flip my glasses up. I don't know if you remember, but the last time you were here in 2019, we would had a similar format, and you were telling us a little bit about it, but you, there, it was, it was the, the press hadn't been out yet. So now we get to hear sort of what you couldn't tell us a couple of years ago, three years ago or four years ago. I've been looking forward to that. Um, and Maestro in 2022 in collaboration with the director, actor, and writer Bradley Cooper. Justin's honors include the National Arts Award, the Golden Plate Honor from the Academy of Achievement, the, Abess the Bessie Award for his ballet Rodeo, Four Dance Episodes, the Gross Family Prize for his ballet Everywhere We Go, the World Choreography Award for West Side Story, and the Tony Award for his work on Broadway's Carousel. As I said, we are the first Justin Peck piece to enter Houston Ballet's repertoire was Year of the Rabbit in 2017. He created a world premiere, Reflections, in 2019. We, per we per have performed that both here in Houston and also toured it to New York City. And then you will, in just a couple short weeks, um, be uh, 
be witness to a brand new world premiere under the folding sky. And with that, I will turn it over to these two masters. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, Jen. Uh, an amazing introduction, and you've made me blush, and now I can't remember <laughs> why I'm here. Um, thank you, Justin, for joining us today. Justin's right in the middle of the final stages of completing your piece. Uh, upstairs has been working every day with the company, and I thought we'd just sort of explore a little bit how we got from the last ballet, the last time we sat here, to this new work. Um, so could you first of all talk a little bit about uh, the ballet and uh, how you came up with the concept for it? Yes. Um, so I started thinking about, I, you know, we talked about potentially me coming to do another new work yeah. after, um, after Reflections. Um, and I, I was thinking a lot about the last session I spent here in Houston and a, a personal discovery that, that I experienced, which was um, going to see this exhibit by James Terrell at Rice University. Has anyone seen that? It's like this, it's one of the greatest works of art in the world, I think. And it's so, it's just such a special experience. It's like this, um, this play with the light uh, that frames the sky and it's only at sunrise and at sunset and it's um, meant to be experienced over the course of the, in, the entire like arc of what that is. So it's like about a 40 minute experience. And I was really taken by that. And um, just the fact that like when you go and you experience art, let's say you go to a museum and you look at something Oftentimes you look at, like, let's say, a painting for like two minutes, five minutes, and then you move on to something else. And this was this kind of transcendent experience where you just take it in in real time and it shifts so, so slowly, incrementally, in ways that it almost feels like you're watching grass grow, but it creates this kind of like peace and this like meditative quality. And it made me think a lot about the experience of, of watching dance and how it's like you sit down, you sit in the theater, and then the lights go down and you sort of give yourself over to this experience. And it's one of those few moments where it's like, okay, this is gonna be like a half hour of my time. Um, and so I wanted to pull inspiration from my, I guess my own personal experience with that Terrell exhibit and try and um, create something that's not, not necessarily similar um, aesthetically or visually to that, but more um, taking inspiration conceptually from that. So it's, um, for me, this is about creating a piece that um, slowly shifts over the course of a one act. Um, it uh, evolves, it grows, it changes very incrementally um, over time, and I, I think it's working to the effect that I want it to be because it's like, you have to feel it from minute to minute uh, all the way to the very end for it to really have the impact that, um, that we're aiming for it to have. And um, yeah, it's been really exciting to work on. It's a, it's a big piece. Um, it's 24 dancers, so. The last work I made, I guess, was a little bit more intimate. It was 11, um, and these kind of like vignette things. And this is much more about this like universe that expands from like one singular dancer to then this like meteor shower of 24 dancers moving through space. So it's kind of also like you know I find I've been thinking about this a lot. It's like um, there's this thing about making work or like making art that's about like finding order in the chaos of the world. And I feel like this is a case where it's like, okay, I'm taking this inspiration from like this Terrell exhibit. Um, I'm taking uh, uh, inspiration from Houston Ballet, from the dancers here, from the artists here, from like my own experience working here and then where I came from and where we're gonna go next. Um, and then the third element I guess I would say is like, I'm always so musically driven as a choreographer, and this was something that actually you were really encouraging of when I was t having conversations with you about, you know, what what sort of music would be right for this. And I brought up this kind of 
what I think is a, a hidden gem of a piece by Philip Glass. Um, and <laughs> Philip Glass is, you know, it's a, he's a, his music is commonly used by a lot of dance makers. And so I, I, um, I rarely use his music, but so there are exceptions to those rules. And I feel like this is a piece that- It's unique music. It's so unique. Well yeah. yeah, it's like, um, I've been listening to this piece for about a decade and just waiting for the right moment and the right sort of stars to align um, to make this. And this has become that moment. And um, it's for full orchestra. It's from an opera he wrote in the 80s called The Photographer. Um, it's not performed too often. And this third act of the opera is just this like massive, um, constantly shifting uh, one act. And it's like, uh, it's like watching a train start from a dormant state and just slowly pick up steam and get a little faster and then a little faster and then a little faster and then suddenly it's like a bullet train before you even realize it and then just like crashes to finish. So, um, so that's the feel of the piece. And yeah, I guess like all those things just like coming together and trying to create a sense of order in what this dance is. It's kind of, a, I think with the Terrell for me, it's the art in nature that the light changing, it's American beauty, it's the plastic bag floating that looks so extraordinary and you can watch it for so long. There's something, nature's art. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and there, there's also, um, I guess I should mention that there's, maybe we'll talk about this too, but there's a visual component to this as well. Um, and uh, I don't want to give too much away from it, but there is a scenic element to this. We're going to get to it. Okay, I, I have them all in my. I won't. I won't. I won't. I won't uh, get ahead of myself. Well, no, but I mean, so the concept was first, like you felt a connection to something in the city with this artist and this work. Then you already had that music. How do you align them? Did you just immediately think this is the one, or do you sometimes have a piece of music that is looking for a concept to fit to it? Or, or what was yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, those were, those were definitely two separate things that were existing in my brain. And like I said, that Philip Glass score, I've been listening to it for 10 years. It's like on this, you know, it's like on and off. I'll put it on and then I'll put it away and maybe I'll do it here, maybe I won't. And then it's like that sort of push and pull until it like reveals itself to be like, this is a thing. And I, I feel like the experience I had at the Terrell and the fact that it's here in Houston feels like it kind of localizes what this is a bit more um, so that it's not a piece that can, that's just like could go anywhere. It feels very like specific to um, not just this company, but like this community here. At least there's a logic to that in my own brain. Like people who see this ballet won't necessarily be like, oh, that connects to the Terrell. I really don't think there's any sort of like visual connection to it, but just the thought process behind it means something. It's the concept, the inspiration. I think that that's key. Yeah. Um, with the music then, once you decided to use it, there's voice in it. How did you go about doing that or making those decisions? Um, the voice element. There is, there is voice in it, but it's more so the voice as an instrument. So there's no lyrics in the music. It's just the sound of the voice. And this was a very complicated behind the scenes, you're, you're getting the behind the scenes access to this process, but it was very complicated to figure out how to get live singers to do this. Um, there were a couple obstacles. Um, one was uh, just finding the singers here who could like do this and like having their schedules align with like the, um, the program that this was gonna happen on. We were struggling a lot with that. And then the other challenge is the vocals sort of like destroy the singer's vocal cords. Cause it's like so, there is so much repetition to it um, that it can, it can really, it's hard to sustain. I think it's a, it's a hard piece to sing. It's physically very hard on the singers. And so uh, we ultimately, made the decision to work with like synthesizer sound. So it's, 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 a, um, 
it's it's almost like a digital created sound that's being performed by a live musician. So they're still activated as, um, you know, we have one of our pianists here um, performing that um, specific part of the score. Catherine's here with us. And um, yes, and, and I wanna just say that Catherine's been like a huge partner in shaping this in the room and super present and a big part of the collaboration to like um, explore this and get more and more specific on how the music and the dance are kind of like melding together. Um, so I'm really grateful that you've been there with us. And um, yeah, she's one, of, she's one of the best anywhere. So um, seriously. And yeah, so, so that's like the decision that was made. And um, so it will be performed live, but it'll be um, a generated sound. And it's, it's also with our full orchestra. So it's a full orchestra piece. Um, so it's going to have like a very large, full sound, rich sound, yeah. And then, so what comes next for you? Do you have the concept of the dancers, how many people, or do you want to go through a design process first to come to that conclusion? Do you, I, does the music tell you how many people? Is there a map? A little bit, yeah. I think it was, I think the next step for this was working with the, uh, the scenic design. And then that informed the cast size because I thought at one point there was going to be a, a sort of mathematical composition to how the dancers fit in relation to the set. And I ended up scrapping that. Um, so that's like, you know, it's like <laughs> it, the way that the piece starts is completely different from what I thought it was going to be. Like I thought it was going to be this like kind of full kind of grand gesture with the full cast on stage. And, um, and I, I think the piece revealed itself to be about um, almost watching like a multicellular organism divide before our very eyes. So it's like that, like we start with a single dancer and it's like a cell dividing from one to two and then two to four and then, you know, multiplying and expanding and so by the end, we're getting 24 dancers, but it feels like, you know, 100 dancers based on the kind of energy and movement and how they're sort of like flying through the space and the, the patterns that are sort of difficult to, um, to, to process in an analytical way, but they're felt. Um, so, yeah. Oh, oh, okay. Collaborators. There we are. <laughs> Um, Do you want to talk about Carl? Carl, yes. I would love to talk, talk about Carl. Carl Jensen is the scenic designer. Um, Carl's a very interesting artist. He's, he's an architect by trade, and he, um, he actually is a graduate of Rice University, so he's another kind of local. <laughs> he's a local, um, even though now he's, he's based in New York City. And um, this is my third time working with Carl. So the first time I worked with Carl was on a ballet called Everywhere We Go, um, which was back in 2014 for New York City Ballet. And Carl sort of specializes in working with complex geometries, working with paper, working with, uh, working with kind of like these, building these like sculptures. Um, and it's very intricate work that he does. And it's the kind of brain that I don't understand. It's like the stuff he's able to do, it's just so um, like miraculous. To, it's, it's that kind of work. And um, I've, I've loved his work for a very long time. Um, he, was, he was actually brought into Everywhere We Go, um, this ballet through Sufjan Stevens, um, who, uh, who worked with him. He designed, so Carl originally First thing Sufian and Carl did together was um, Carl designed a paper ornament for one of Sufian's Christmas albums. So Sufian Stevens did all these like Christmas song covers and he released this record with that music. And as part of that um, record, when you bought it, uh, there was this sort of like instruction for this like, uh, almost like this artifact that you could create and then hang on a tree and had all, you know, it's this like 
three-dimensional thing. And so that was the first thing that they did together. And he's, he's done some like scenic work as well. Um, and so he created a work for us for New York City Ballet, which, um, which is all about two backdrops that move in relation to one another. And the backdrops have all these very specific cutouts in them and light penetrates through from behind. So it creates all these like shifting shapes before our eyes and yet it's all handmade. It's all kind of like, um, it doesn't feel like, it's not like digital, it's, it's very much like um, in, in a theatrical practice. Yeah, it's cloth and light and it's like lo low tech in a way, which I love. And, um, and so the thing about uh, working at New York City Ballet is it's quite limited in what you can do scenically. So, um, so when we were talking about collaborating on this piece, there was just so much more potential in what we could do here compared to um, the theater that we perform in in New York. It's just there's so much more access to space here um, and much more support in terms of uh, um, realizing some of these like scenic ideas. And so Carl's design is very dimensional, like three dimensional piece that um, the, the kind of directive I gave him was um, it should be in constant shifting motion for the entirety of the piece. Um, so it's, again, it's almost like it's moving, but you don't quite notice that it's moving until it's like, it looks a little bit different and then you notice it and then it just kind of like keeps shifting and keeps changing um, until we reach the end. So, uh, so it's all about this kind of like forward motion about like time passing uh, uh, in, a, in a forward direction. So, um, which, um, which feels like a very, uh, a, a nice parallel to the experience of dance and how it's happening in the moment. And it's, it's moving continuously forward along with time. Um, so that's like, that's how Carl came into this. And uh, he built you a little, a model that we saw built, on. He built several models. Right. Yeah. I think I sent you a few of them or I showed you a few yeah. of them, but he's very thorough in his process. So he probably designed like seven or eight, um, completely different models to just taking that directive and taking the dimensions of the theater space here and, uh, and just translating that into some kind of like artistic interpretation. And so it's sort of really fun to work with them in that way. Cause it's like, you know, kid in the candy shop, all of a sudden you're seeing all these different options and these different kind of like toy models. And, and did you know the one you liked straight away or did you? Have yeah, to? yeah, it was like, that's the coolest one. And, <laughs> and also just like in terms of the, the balance of space and symmetry and like, the clearest in terms of the concept that we were after, this is the one that, that felt like the most honest, the most um, direct. So, um, so we, we focused on this and then it continued to change. He built a few other models based off of that version. And then he worked very closely with the scenic shop here and the, the production team. Yeah, and we have a scenic shop in Canada that made it for us. They're the same people that made our Sylvia sets and costumes. I mean, sets, not costumes. Yeah, yeah, so they, and they've been great and, um, and the, the production team's been a great support to kind of like help bring that to life. And, and we're, we're really doing something that I don't, I don't feel like anything's quite been done like this, so it's, it's a lot of like all hands on deck to figure out how to realize it and make it, um, you know, it's, it's, it's like a, it's a physical challenge. It's like, um, how do we, how do we um, pull off the physics of this gesture? Because it's moving the whole length of the work. Yeah, and it's moving in a way that it starts, it's dormant state is sort of like one dimension and then it kind of like expands into the vertical space, so. Um, and do the dancers interact with it? They don't really. It's kind of meant to be separate. Um, but I, I did think originally they would be sort of like divided in and through it. And then, but it felt almost like unnecessary to do that. Yeah. Um, but we'll see. I mean, it could, it could still change. I haven't actually seen the 
set yet. So we we have it taped out. That, that's a normal process. Yeah. So you don't normally get to see or touch any of this until a few days before. So Justin and the dancers and the set will arrive on Friday on, on stage for the first time collectively. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I've seen some videos of like mock-up versions of the sets, like slightly smaller versions of the sets made from like cheaper materials and that's kind of how we've learned about how it works and what we need to change and stuff like that. Pretty so. sure it's here, I've seen trucks. Okay, good. <laughs> there, are, there, are, there are trucks that don't, there's been no panic, I've got no panic to email. <laughs> and, and then, uh, so you start with the scenery, what about then with light? Because you've worked with Brandon for a, a lot and uh, I find light is so important for dance in particular, or maybe everything actually, as I've gotten older. Uh, was that the next concept or was it into the costumes? No, uh, Brandon is, um, I feel like I kind of learned this after working on the West Side Story film where I, I was able to witness very closely that um, the relationship between the the director and the DP, the director of photography, working on that film, cinematographer working on that film, and I realized that it's like, it's such a tight partnership um, between those two roles um, to make the film, and it's, it's very involved, and there's a million decisions that have to be made, and, um, and everything sort of matters, and there's, a, there's Steven Spielberg's worked with Janusz Kaminski the DP since they made Schindler's List. So it's a very long working relationship the two of them have. And so there's a, there is a real shorthand between them that was just fascinating to watch, to get to observe. And I, it kind of like, it was an interesting ref reflection for me in, in a way for me to think about my own process as a choreographer working, creating work for the stage. And I, I realized that I've also been cultivating this relationship with sort of the equivalent of that. Um, so with Brandon Baker, who is, I th really think of him as like the, the kind of cinematographer, like the director of photography of this stage work, even though you know his role is, he's technically the lighting designer, but it's so much about light and directing where the focus goes and um, yeah. Like it's kind of like editing sometimes. Yeah, like yeah. You draw the attention of the audience to it. Yeah, and there's even like a process of like storyboarding with Brandon and like creating, uh, you know, visual references and sources of inspiration and um, and just like sequencing the whole thing and talking it through. And he he's someone he's a creative collaborator that I I literally talk to him every day, um, whether it's through emails or texts or calls or or in person, um, because we work. You know, we're working together on this and a couple other projects, and so it's just constant, there's a constant back and forth, and it makes it really fun, because then, you know, you kind of have a buddy um, along the way. You got someone, like, um, sitting with you and bringing the thing to life in a creative way and in a way that, you know, his focus is so specialized in a different way than um, what I'm doing, what everyone else is doing. And, um, but it's, it's that kind of theater-making thing where it's, it requires so many people, it's such a village to bring the thing to life. Um, but also a time crunch because he also doesn't even start until probably Thursday. Yeah. Um, first starts to light the set with you all. Yeah, it's kind of, I mean, yeah, it's sort of similar, I find, to the process. For me, it's like when I'm making a ballet the amount of hours in the studio with the dancers is like a fraction of the work that goes into the ballet. It's like there is, working in the studio with the dancers is like 20%, and then the other 80% is all the preparation, all the kind of thinking through, all the planning, all the collaborating with the, um, the artists involved, um, all the moments in solitude spent uh, thinking about the big picture, thinking about the this, one four count step and what goes there and you know it's like all those things and I think for Brandon it's probably similar it's like a lot of preparation and then it's like the pressure cooker like you get there and it's like okay you have 
three hours today and three hours tomorrow, and you have to like the whole thing. What are you gonna do? And so it's kind of like a, you know, dinner rush, and you're the you're like the chefs behind the scene. You're just like <laughs> frantically trying to like create all the plates and make sure everything's like done well, but you've done all the prep beforehand so that you can pull it off. So emergency room is the analogy we often use. It oh, <laughs> the ambulance pulls up and you oh. uh, immediately. Oh um, man. Yeah. Yeah, I could feel like that sometimes, too. <laughs> and then Reed and Harriet, also you have worked with and collaborated with for a while, whose costumes are here. Um, is that the third stage? Is yeah, yeah, definitely. I would say, like, that's the third stage. And for this piece, we wanted to create... Uh, this, is, this is one of those costumes that's, uh, I assure you, will uh, we'll have its magic when you have a little distance and the right light on it. <laughs> but it's not, it's, it's sort of like a, it's a minimalist um, look to it. And it's about sort of creating like a unified uh, kind of cohesive look for the cast. And so that, because part of the intention was like, not to create a sense of hierarchy. It's like, it's the pieces, it's very much like an, an ensemble piece. Um, even though there are standout dancers throughout it, and there are soloists, and there are principal dancers, and there's even a few really crucial central paradas in it, it still feels like all part of one um, organism. And so visually, in, in regards to the costume design, that's something we wanted to present and so it felt like you could almost like blur, blur your eyes and just take in like the moving mass of this like organism. Yeah. Um, so so we'll see how that looks too, yeah. And Reed was a dancer because I, I worked with him in Ohio but how did you meet them? How did you find um, I, I met Reed, it's kind of interesting, both with Brandon Baker and Reed Bartleman and Harriet Jung, the two, they're like a, a partnership team that design costumes. So um, we all kind of started at the same time. It's like that kind of thing where um, Brandon was interning. He, he received this actually this really prestigious internship um, in New York City where he got to uh, intern at New York City Ballet, Alvin Ailey, uh, Paul Taylor, and I think like maybe the, the Met Opera for over the course of a year. And, um, and that's when I met him, you know, he was interning, he got to design this like random like choreographic thing where I was making some of my, you know, one of my first pieces ever and that was the first time we worked together. Similar with uh, Reed and Harriet, um, they were just graduating from uh, the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York City and um, I, I sort of knew about Reed. He's, um, very kind of plugged into the dance scene in New York and someone suggested him um, as, a, as a designer that he was just sort of finishing his, his education and we just met up and he designed like one of the first duets I made like back in, I don't know, 2010 and, and then since then we've just kind of continued to work together on and off over the years and so, yeah, it's another kind of like... Lifetime. Yeah, and there's like that shorthand. That's and great. Yeah, it's like, um, it's, it's really, it can be really key, I think. It's so. interesting that the lighting is the DP. Out of yeah. The, yeah, I agree. I think the lighting is the most crucial. I feel you could always put a dancer in a leotard, <laughs> and if the lighting is great, it can still make extraordinary product. Yeah. Totally. I, I completely agree with that, so... And then the casting. So how do you cast? How did you know? You seem to know who you wanted. You're very organized, which I love. Uh, but are you? <laughs> I mean, that, is that real? Or I think you... some some of it, yes, yeah, some of it, no. I mean, <laughs> I I feel like I well the, well the nice thing I'll say is that there's having um, created a piece here a few years ago and then working a couple years before that on Near the Rabbit, it's like, oh, I start to really know the company. And I love that, because I hate going to a place and just 
having it be this kind of like blind date thing and just trying to like get to know people and I find that the work is a lot better if there's a kind of human connection um, with the artists in the room and then there's, there's just more creativity that can spin out of that. And I, so I appreciate getting to sort of like return and make something again for the company and just like knowing that there's certain dancers that I want to work with again. There's other dancers I wanted to work with last time but there, the cast wasn't big enough so now there's more opportunities for that. And then there's like new dancers that weren't around when I came last time who I'm curious about and I'm just learning about as I come here and work. And so I think I designed the rehearsal process in a way so that I could start on smaller bits where I knew, okay, I'm gonna work with these dancers that I sort of know or some that I've heard about. And I had a couple meetings with um, with the artistic staff to just ask questions about the dancers and the, and, um, and the casting. Um, and then I did a few rehearsals with the whole company, just working through some very short phrases and um, assembled the cast in that way. And like I mentioned, the structure of the piece, it's really, it starts from one dancer to two to four and so on and so forth. And so I just started early on <laughs> with the small groups. And then as it built out, I sort of got to know which dancers would feed into that. And, um, and so it just worked out that the structure of the piece um, lend itself well to this process of casting. And I, and I love that 24, you know, double that is nearly our entire company once you've got covers <laughs> in the cast, which is yeah. great because I want them all to have the, I mean, they all want to have the experience with you too. Yeah, and they've been like really great team players about like just honoring the vision for the work and not, no one's ever been like, this part isn't big enough for me or I'm not like dancing enough or like, they're, everyone's just been like really present and there for like this process, whatever. That's the key. Yeah, yeah, it's really amazing. Doesn't that? It's not like that everywhere. So, good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah so then, um, uh, in watching the piece, of course, there are many highlighted people, but there's somebody who I think really st stood out to me immediately, which was Tyler. Uh, do you? Did you come with that in mind for her? Did that just occur to you? Do you sometimes make something specifically for an energy of a dancer or a type of dancer? Because it just seems that you have, it has such a connection for the two of you there. Yeah, I mean, she's, she's really a special artist, special dancer here. And this is Tyler Donatelli. Um, and uh, I just, yeah, I remember, when I first came for You're the Rabbit, like she was, I think she was probably in the core and just you, you pointed her out and you're like, oh, she's, she's, gonna, she's sort of on the rise and we worked together back then. And so again, it's like the continuity of getting to work with that person again and again. And, and she's also like one of those, this is something I talk about sometimes, which is like, she's one of those dancers that um, helps to define the identity of a ballet company. So like when you look at Houston Ballet, you're like who, like what, what is the identity of Houston Ballet? Who helps to define that? Like of course it's the work that's being done, but I think it's, it's really the dancers who like bring it to life and, um, and the kind of distinction that they bring to it that no one else can. And there's some dancers who kind of like, I mean it's rare, but there'll be a few that like rise to a certain level um, and she's one of them and she's like, she, yeah, I guess she's like someone when you look at Houston Valley and you think like what makes this unique compared to another company, it's like a dancer like that who is kind of thriving in this institution and in the rep here and growing over time and, you know, um, so that's, I guess you can imagine that there's like inspiration from all that that manifests its way into some of the material of the piece. And I do think that the intention was really, it was ori 
originally to create this kind of like quartet for four, but she just kept, she was always like right there. And I was like, well, I'll just give you something right now for this thing. <laughs> and then it just, she became this sort of like, like, um, like airplane pilot that just flies through this piece. I don't know, it's really it's amazing. on the ground for her I've yeah. seen several times. And she's, and you're very musical as a choreographer and I think I can see that in, you like musical dances. I think. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. She, and she is super musical. How can, can you describe musicality? What, what, what do you, how do you think if you were to describe that to someone who? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I think it's like, it's, it's something that, um, it's not just about like dancing on the beat, exactly. it's like how they're in control of yeah. their like choices in relation to the music. So sometimes it, if a dancer's really musically gifted, they'll, um, there's, the, I guess like the most obvious thing to say about it is like, if there's a phrase and it ends on four, that like a dancer could potentially like draw out that phrase until four is like just about to pass and you think they're gonna be late and then they speed up and they like arrive back onto the five. And it's like, yeah, it's like its own kind of mus musicianship and it's like... Like jazz riffing inside choreography somehow yeah yeah phrasing and pulling yeah it. like in the in the in the meter in, in the measure it's like how do they kind of fill it and and the difference is like the dancer is both the musician and the instrument because their kind of physical body is what's being like played by the mind i guess so um so instead of being like you know someone playing the violin and you can see the violin. And of course there's a physicality to that, but there's like two separate things. The dancers like both of those things together. Um, so yeah, that's one of the, I think one of the coolest things about watching dance and the dancers perform. And not every dance, every dance can be musical, but not everyone can play in that, in that gap, in that breath. Yeah, and it's a hard thing to teach. Right? I don't know yeah. if it's teachable. It's like, <laughs> you can try, but so much of it is like, comes innately. In, innately. Yeah, innate. Yeah. Um, so then, what about the title? Um, is that one of the last things you uh, yes. come up? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Usually it's like, people bug me long enough and then I ha I, I'm five days past the deadline and Yep. It's hard because you don't know what it is, right? It's like, what do you want? To, what you have to call it something, but it's being made, and we haven't figured it out yet. Like, and it's hard. To, it's also like, especially with an abstract dance, where it's like, uh, you put words on it, and then people are gonna like, they're not gonna have just the experience of the dance. Like, I almost want to just call things like Untitled Number Seven, Opus Four, or something. Yeah, uh, but that's also kind of boring. It's like, how do you market? <laughs> so it's um, so we tried to just create a title that felt like poetic and like it alludes to um, to some of the visuals and some of the um, the feel of the piece. And it's under the folding sky. Yes. And did you make that up or is it? It was um, kind of like through a bunch of reading and wordplay and like just reading a lot, a lot of poetry and kind of finding a. a it's not like direct from like something, but it's, it comes from a process of reading a lot and then also thinking a lot about the piece. And I just, I also thought it was like a nice nod to the Terrell. Yeah, yeah cause that's like under the folding sky, it's like you're, you're down there looking, like literally looking up through this like folded thing. And, and you can go to Texas a little bit too, cause we're the big sky country and totally. the sky is something that you noticed in Texas. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. So it just felt like a like a felt like the right title. It's actually early for me to submit a title earlier than normal. So I was proud of that. In time for print. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, we're nearly at the end before we ask some questions. But uh, uh, first of all, I want to say I, I've seen the ballet with a couple of minutes left before he finished, and it's extraordinary piece. 
uh, I really love it, Justin, and you're an inspiration. And I think that what I love so much is when I watch something as a choreographer and I think, how? And, and it gives you goosebumps. And certainly the Philip Glass, I'm not always a fan of Philip Glass, but I am with this and what you took it to is a whole new level and I think the audience is going to be thrilled and it's an outstanding program and I, I thank you for your great work for us. Thank you. Thanks for that. So, uh, we're going to ask some questions if people have questions and I think, uh, unless, Jen, are you going to, do you have a microphone? Or? I will, yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I was very interested to hear you say that in preparing for casting, you spoke to the artistic staff and asked questions about the dancers and so forth. Can you give us some examples about what kinds of questions were you asked? I'll just repeat the question. The question is about when you talk to the artistic staff and you're trying to get some feedback about the dancers, what kind of questions might you ask? Um, I, I'll ask them just especially about dancers that I haven't seen or worked with, like questions about what kind of rep they dance, what sort of um, roles they've performed, what kind of, uh, uh, you know, how, how they're, what kind of attitudes they have in the studio, have other choreographers work with them, um, questions about musicality. Um, just, kind of their resume in a way. Yeah, and also just trying to get just like questions that provoke some feedback. It doesn't have to be like anything specific. It's more like um, just trying to like learn more about the dancers and um, and this, the staff is like super supportive of the dancers too. Like the way that they talk about them is like, you know, it's always like, it's really positive like glow on the dancers, which is great, but also true. Like every, all the dancers that, you know, pretty much all of them are involved in this process. So it's like, you can kind of see why they talk about them that way too, so. And just to explain, so if you don't know, you arrive as a choreographer, you watch class, ballet class, that's sort of how you cast. And in that you don't see any partnering, you don't see any acting. You don't see if they're good at contemporary. They're really reduced down to the base ele element of classical ballet technique. Um, you, you may have worked with them before. You may have seen them in another ballet. But if, if you asked what their library of work is and you see, oh, they've worked with really contemporary people or they've done a lot of partnering or they've been the lead of these big full-length ballets, you, you know already that they have a certain caliber, I think. Yeah. I also watched, I asked for some videos of work that was being performed. Um, I watched the Arthur Pita uh, ballet, which is a new commission this year, and then like a Mark Morris piece and um, a couple other things. Um, so it was like two separate programs and that was helpful too. But of course like video sort of flattens the energy. So it's, it's limited can't just cast from that, so. Another question? Yes. I'm a vocalist, so for the music, using Philip Glass's opera, converting that into, you said you wanted the sound in the voice, but you don't want words. So are they humming? No. Are they doing oohs and ahs? Yeah, are yeah. Are and gnashing of teeth? <laughs> what are they doing? They're doing, it's, 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 it's pretty much oohs and ahs, I would say. I'm just going to repeat the question. The question was, as, as a vocalist, uh, removing the words uh, and replacing them with the synthetic sound. But they weren't words initially. There, there were, it was Philip, always that. Yeah, that Philip, kind of. Philip Glass didn't write words. It w it's literally, ooh, ooh, yeah, like ooh. the sound of, <laughs> of, ooh, of the voice. Um, so we're, we're not stripping any lyrics from, from <laughs> So Catherine was saying that the, the, there's no characters or words that have been taken out of it. This section of the opera is all 
vocalization used as an instrument, if I'm saying that correctly, kind of like Bobby McFerrin in Hush would be a, a way of thinking about it, uh, that it's sort of more instrumental. Yeah. Instrumental, yeah. <laughs> yes? Totally. How do we allow the dancers to express their individual creativity in the process? So, um, so it's, for me, every choreographer works differently. Some choreographers come in with nothing and it's all done in the moment. Some choreographers ask the dancers to improvise and they kind of pull from that. Some choreographers come in with like everything planned out and prepared to like every step. Um, there's a full spectrum, and for me, it's about generating some like loose phrase work that is built off of uh, the music and how that inspires me, and a lot of um, self exploration using my own body as an instrument, and then taking some of that material and like passing it to the dancer and seeing how what they do with it. And sometimes that evolves to something else and they pass it back to me and then I take it somewhere else and there's this kind of like tennis match in the room of how it then develops from that point. And I think that's actually like the most exciting part of the process because it's like the chemistry in the room and like the kind of human nature and the, uh, the, the human error that sometimes leads you down an interesting road and somewhere unexpected and, um, and yeah, it's like very nuanced and very like, and very social, I'll say. It's like, it's a very social exchange. Like the process, once you get into the room with the dancers, there's a lot of conversation about it and, and a lot of also like communication through, um, through, the, through the body um, and back and forth with that. So yeah, that's how, the process works for me, I would say. When you make a group section, do you make it on one or two people specifically and then uh, spread it to the ensemble or do you try to, or, or is it different from ballet to ballet? Yeah. Um, i trying to think. It's a good I hard think question. It's, yeah, I think it's, <laughs> it's both. And I think like, hmm, trying to, I'm trying to like go back. It was such a like fever dream building a lot of these like big group sections where we're just like flying. We're like in a like a fugue state or something. But um, no, it's uh, sometimes it's like with the big group stuff. I will um, I'll come in with like a preliminary like sketch or storyboard of like movement so that I have an understanding of how like 24 bodies move through space in relation to each other within the um, the dimensions of the stage and then oftentimes that also goes in different directions it's just like important to have a starting point um, so that if you're prepared you can like depart from that I think it's like for me, it's not great if I have like no idea and then it's like, where does, where do we go from here? Like how, and you have, you know, it's like, it's, it's like if you were writing a story on, on a piece of paper, piece of paper and you had like 50 people looking over your shoulder, <laughs> reading every word you were writing, right? You would want to have like a little bit of an idea of what it was you were going to write before 50 people I had their eyes on like every letter and word you're writing out. So it's a little bit like that to make a ballet, I would say. Yes. Okay, so you don't often find people that can do Broadway and ballet. So how did you start? Did you start in ballet and go Broadway or vice versa? And what were some of the challenges that you faced in trying to go between the two dimensions? Okay, this is, just to repeat, there's sometimes not a lot of crossover between ballet and Broadway. Um, so um, she was asking what, uh, how, what was my trajectory to get there and what are some of the challenges working in both worlds? 
And I would say I feel, you know, strange way, like more of an outsider to the ballet world than to the theater world. And that's because I started in theater when I was, when I was a kid growing up. And I actually started because I saw a show called Bring in the Noise, Bring in the Funk, which is a sh an amazing show um, made by George C. Wolfe and Savion Glover. And Savion's this incredible tap dancer. And I saw it when I was nine and I was like, what, what is this? This is so amazing. I wanna learn more about this. And I just became obsessed with tap dance and with theater. And so I studied those um, for, for many years and did a lot of theater growing up and thought like I wanted to pursue that. And, um, and then when I was 13 or 14, I saw American Ballet Theater I saw Julie Kent performing in Giselle, um, and I was really blown away by that as well, and the storytelling in, in ballet, and I, the city I grew up in was not a big dance town, so it was, was that? Uh, in San Diego, I grew up in San Diego, and so it's not a big dance town, and ABT randomly was touring through San Diego f the first and last time they'd like ever been there, and I saw that <laughs> performance, and that kind of set me off on, on a different course. And I was like, oh, I'm kind of curious about this. I trained really hard. And then I realized that like ballet was like my ticket to New York, like from a young age. So I just like worked really hard. And then I heard about this school called the School of American Ballet, which was in New York at Lincoln Center. And they had dorms. It was like a boarding school. And I um, eventually I got in there when, and I moved there when I was uh, just before I turned 16. So I, um, came to New York and sort of got swallowed up by like the ballet process. But I always wanted to um, participate in the theater community. And so once I was making work as a choreographer, uh, there was this opportunity for me to um, choreograph the, uh, the Broadway revival of Carousel um, in 2018. And that actually traditionally historically has a connection to ballet in that it was originally chore choreographed by Agnes DeMille. Yeah. And so there is like, you know, the dream ballet in it and, um, and some, uh, some dancing that requires like strong technique, cl classical technique. And um, so it felt like a good bridge, good crossover project to work on. And, um, and it was just so fun, so different. And it's, it's such a, and in a test of endurance because it's it's a massive show. It's I remember we did um, close to sixty previews, so had to watch the show after rehearsing it and getting it all prepared and spending like days and days and days working on it. Then you work on it all day. You take a little break from like five thirty to seven thirty, and then you watch the show every night and then the show finishes, you stay with the team afterwards and you talk about all the changes you're gonna put in the next day and you get up and do it all over again. Sort of wild, the whole process. Um, so it's just much more like, theater is much more like singularly focused. It's like we're all working towards this like one singular show and working in the ballet world um, in the company like Houston Ballet, it's, it's, it has a, a, a tremendous focus but it's like, you know, we're working on this program now, and then in a few months it'll be a different program, and then they're gonna do Swan Lake, and those are all, um, it, it's, uh, I guess it's just a different way of like, kind of like portioning it out. Um, so that's the biggest difference I would say, yeah. But both are, I mean, I feel really lucky that I get to work in both of those worlds. I think there's, and there's a lot to learn from both of them and bring into the other, uh, other medium or whatever. And like, I, I feel like I learned a lot from working on Carousel and I've brought that into my process into the, into the ballets I make for New York City Ballet or Houston Ballet, so yeah. I think we have one more question if we have time or if there is one more question, if not, yes. Question was, what was it like working with Steven Spielberg on the motion picture side of, I guess, dance, right? Yeah. Um, it was the adventure of a lifetime. I loved it. He was amazing to work with. Great uh, team captain, great uh, 
in inclusive leader. And um, for me, it was, I, I didn't quite realize it until I was in it, but it was like this incredible masterclass in filmmaking because I was brought on into a role that he doesn't normally incorporate into his films. Um, he's never done a movie musical, and he um, very quickly realized that the choreographer, he needed to find a choreographer and someone who would be like thoroughly involved in the process from early, early stages, like I'm talking probably like two years out to you know having extensive back and forth about the numbers and how they'll come to life visually through the camera lens um, to then rehearsing, to then uh, going through the process of filming a lot of this material on his iPhone and editing some of that together and like talking about it and then um, eventually working our way up to shooting it on set. And it was just like another major endurance test because we would work these very long days. Like we would get up at like five in the morning and go to go to set that was like an hour away and then start shooting and just being there all day until we finish. Like you don't know when the day is gonna end. It could go into the night if they want to, just depending on the schedule. And so it was just hours and days and weeks and months just sitting next to Steven and getting to witness all the choices and all the, um, all, all, the, all the ways in which he works and then just getting so much downtime. So you just kind of like talk and ask, I could ask him any questions I wanted. And so it was amazing in that way. And, and similarly, like for me, able, I was able to bring a lot of that experience into other projects, for, both for film and for the stage. Like I, I created my first full length a uh, project for New York City Ballet, all set to music by Aaron Copeland. And the way that I made that uh, full evening event was very similar to the way that a film gets um, organized and storyboarded and like scheduled and sort of like broken down um, so that it's not created in like a linear way and yet the vision is for it to be like this linear experience at the end. So, um, so like both with the West Side Story and with this Copeland Full Evening Project, we jumped around a lot. It's like we started on West Side Story by shooting Cool, which comes in the middle of the film, and then we went ahead to the you know the last scene in the film, and then we went back to the beginning, and and everything is in pieces and patchwork, and it comes together only in the editing room. And it was similar, I think, working on this Copeland piece in that like, okay, I'm gonna make this one little variation here, and then I'm gonna do the finale, and then I'm gonna go back to the opening, and how do all these things connect, and having a lot of thought in how, in, in I guess like the, the full arc of the evening, and then diving into the details, so. Um, so yeah, I think like, so Jaws the Ballet. Jaws the Ballet. <laughs> Although there, there is some, I think there's a play about it. It's a Jaws. musical. It was, yeah. yeah, we had a musical. Oh, really? We actually taught it in the summer school, one of the songs from it. Gail oh. Gail and Miller did it. Do you remember? Anyway. Uh, <laughs> well, anyway, yeah, it was, a, it was a really fun experience. And um, yeah, it's, I think it's streaming somewhere if anyone hasn't seen it. Well, thank you, Justin, for... Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Stanford.